all very welcome. Um, I have a little bit of a broadband, um, uh, what would I say, issue. <laughs> uh, so I may switch off my uh, video once I've said hello to you, but uh, thanks, thanks everybody for joining us today. What we're going to speak to you about is our experience of um, translating universal design for learning policy into practice and the way that we've approached that is it through the development of a, a toolkit for Moodle uh, which draws on the, the UDL principles uh, and offers practical advice and tools uh, for academics at DCU to, to translate those principles into practice. And um, whoops, okay, there we go. Uh, just to give you an overview of our presentation, um, Karen is going to introduce you to Universal Design for Learning very briefly. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Universal Design for Learning principles, but just to frame the, the discussion around the toolkit, then I'm going to link the, the work of the UDL toolkit to the DigComp Edu framework and also make reference to some of the findings uh, from the index survey uh, that was published last week. We're going to give you an overview of the components of the toolkit. And then back to Karen, she's going to speak to you about the development process uh, of the toolkit uh, and a little bit about uh, feedback from our pilot users. And then we'll just wrap up um, by outlining our next steps, which includes the sharing of the toolkit through Creative Commons structures uh, soon enough, probably in June, uh, all going well. So with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Karen. Thanks, Suzanne. So I suppose to briefly provide a quick overview about universal design for learning, it's a framework essentially to improve and to optimize teaching, learning and assessment by removing bar barriers in the environment, both physical and virtual. So we think that small considered changes to practice can make the curriculum accessible for everyone. And essentially it ensures that a high quality of education for students can still happen and certainly provides for full and very active participation for learners. So this practice improves student engagement and retention while positively enhancing the learning experience for everyone. UDL promotes the use of multiple approaches in teaching, learning and assessment, and it's encompassed by three main principles. So they are the multiple means of representation, multiple means of student engagement and multiple means of action or expression. So UDL is considered best practice for inclusion by suggesting flexible instructional materials, techniques and strategies that can empower educators to meet the varied needs of learners. So the three principles of UDL can help us refine how we approach who we teach, what we teach and also how we teach. And as we all know, technology enables the quick modification of learning materials to meet the specific needs of our students. But it also means that virtual learning environments such as Moodle are really well placed to address the goal of universal design for learning. So it's the responsibility of institutions and developers who maintain these environments to plan for inclusive practice. In DCU, we recognise that learning is a partnership between learners and teachers, and we hope to employ student-centred learning design where the student voice is heard and that informs the design and implementation of the learning experiences. So in order to enhance this inclusivity of the learning experience, what we intend to do is to um, promote the principles of UDL in the design and delivery of all of our programs. And I suppose now more than ever, we're required to design our programs to allow more flexible delivery online and also using the technology that is available to us. So to fulfill the commitment that's outlined in the DCU strategic plan and the constituent teaching and learning strategies, we've tried to draw on expertise and best practice across DCU and beyond to implement a UDL pedagogic framework to underpin our institutional approach to teaching, learning and assessment. So maybe Suzanne will discuss the European uh, framework for digital competencies. Um, and really, I suppose what we're looking at here is number five, empowering learners. Thanks, Karen, um, and apologies if I got the timing on moving the slides a little bit wrong Not there. Not at all, perfect. Um, uh, okay, so the, the, you, the work of the UDL toolkit uh, speaks to the, the dimension number five in the DigComp Edu framework, which is um, called Empowering Learners. And uh, 
this dimension is broken down into three parts. The first uh, relates to accessibility and inclusion, which obviously uh, speaks to developing re learning resources and activities that um, are accessible to all learners, but it also speaks to uh, considering learners' expectations and their digital uh, abilities or capacities. Uh, the next um, part of this dimension, differentiation and personalization, uh, explores offering choice to learners. So perhaps allowing learners to advance at their own pace uh, through a piece of learning or to, um, to develop the development of individual learning pathways. And then the final part or aspect of the dimension is the active uh, engagement of learners, both in terms of engaging with the content and then engaging with a creative expression uh, of their learning. Okay, so you can see how um, those three aspects of Dimension 5 connect quite easily with the Universal Design for Learning Principles. Uh, the first one, accessibility and inclusion, uh, connects to multiple means of representation. Differentiation and personalization then uh, connects to multiple means of engagement. And then the active engagement of learners speaks to two of the principles, multiple means of engagement and multiple means of action or expression. And just, we wanted, because the index survey is hot off the press, uh, we just wanted to mention two um, findings from that report uh, a, very briefly that are relevant to the UDL uh, toolkit. Uh, students have called in the, in the survey for consistency around the use of the VLE. And we feel that the UDL toolkit offers some opportunities uh, and tools for staff to create consistency um, uh, in their use of the VLE. And the, and the other finding that stood out to us when we were preparing for this session was that students are in, uh, calling for improved navigation and signposting in the use of the VLE, which we also feel the, the toolkit can offer some guidance and support around. So the toolkit itself uh, comprises of three different parts. Uh, the first is an introduction or overview of UDL, which is available in both text and video format in line with Universal Design for Learning Principles. Uh, the second piece is a Moodle uh, template, which I'm going to show to you shortly, um, which uh, seeks to address the issues raised in the index survey around uh, creating some consistency in the use of VLE. And then we've got, um, we've got a series of UDL checklists, which we hope will also support uh, engagement with UDL principles for staff. So uh, just bear with me because I want to share the template with you. So I need to get another screen up. If anybody can sing while I'm just getting this <laughs> up. Okay. And there we go. Apologies. Okay, so you can see that the template is, is very, very simple. It's not a, a very complicated uh, toolkit. You will see over here on the right, we've got um, a little um, section for the course uh, outline or the contact details of the lecture, and also a, a placeholder, an image placeholder, where we're encouraging people to pop a picture of themselves up just to, to orient the students. Uh, and their office hours is the last uh, kind of suggestion that we have in that section. We've got in the introductory um, uh, section of the page, we've got automatically an announcement or a course news forum. Uh, we've also added an ask a question forum, the DCU academic integrity and plagiarism policy. And then we've popped in a, um, a template for a Moodle handbook where we're hoping that people will populate with uh, material related to their own uh, specific module. And then very importantly, over on the left, we've got uh, by default the accessibility toolbar available within the template. Karen is going to speak to you um, more about the development of the toolkit, but one of the uh, surprises that we had when we began uh, developing the toolkit was how few people were actually aware of this uh, toolbar. Uh, or block within within Moodle. 
uh, and how well received it was when they became aware of, of the, the uh, accessibility block. So that's here um, by default in our template uh, as part of the toolkit. Okay, stop sharing, back to the slides. Bear with me a moment. Okay, here we go. So then we've got um, our UDL guideline checklist. And the idea uh, here is that we've provided uh, a range of checklist types for staff. Originally, what we, what we thought was that we would present these um, options to, to staff and that they would select their preferred type of checklist. But actually the feedback to us was that uh, they'd like to have uh, all of the checklist types available in the toolkit and that they would choose the uh, appropriate toolkit or checklist for their particular context uh, at any particular time. So you'll see the first one here is a, a tick box um, kind of checklist which goes through each of the, the UDL uh, principles and then breaks it down into checkpoints around the guidelines. So people just have a look at the, the, the suggestions there and they tick the box if they've um, met all of the requirements. The next one is the educator checklist, which was developed by CAST. And this again uh, breaks down each of the um, UDL principles and then the subheadings. But here they offer kind of uh, ideas or examples around how you might address each of those checkpoints on the UDL uh, principle list. And it also offers some space uh, for your own ideas or notes over here to the right. So it, it, it's um, a little step up from the last one. And then our final uh, checklist type is, is a progression rubric uh, adapted from a rubric designed by Melissa Toland. We have the reference in these slides, which will be shared later. And what we did was um, we took uh, Melissa's design and we incorporated the dimensions of the three framework developed by Napier University to support the um, engagement of staff with technology enhanced learning. So we, we took those three dimensions and we mapped them onto Melissa's design. So you'll see here on the left, you've got your, your checkpoint uh, relating to principle one. And then at each dimension of the framework, uh, there are some um, examples and definitions offered uh, within the, 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 the breakdown of the checkpoints. So you'll see here, uh, use a Melissa this is language uh, if you're at a level of emerging practice uh, in UDL. Um, you, you've got your choices here at checkpoint one, checkpoint two, checkpoint three. Uh, then you can move on to proficient and finally to expert level. And we've mapped those on using the language of the three framework, enhance, extend and empower. Okay, so I'm going to pass back to Karen who's going to speak to you a little bit about how uh, we actually developed the toolkit. Thanks, Suzanne. I suppose taken from our experience as learning technologists and academic developers, we really thought about designing and developing the process of the toolkit, really to be in consultation and partnership with our colleagues. Um, we can all agree and we all know that uh, we're all busy and I suppose we didn't want to just start designing the toolkit without consultation. We wanted to really try to empower educators and empower those who teach across the university and to really make this toolkit useful and beneficial for them and their practice. So what we wanted to do was to try and sketch an outline of exactly what would be useful, I guess, what would be um, a kind of a starting point perhaps for, for our colleagues. And really this started with a focus group. So what we wanted to do was to um, engage those um, who teach. We wanted to pilot with uh, two faculties who had uh, different experiences, I guess, and engagement with Moodle. And we wanted them to kind of tell us what exactly they need. We wanted this to be something that enhances their practice, but not so burdensome or not so cumbersome that would stop them in their tracks to implement a UDL template just like this. So that consultation or that initial focus groups um, were really, really informative for us in designing and outlining um, some of the resources that Suzanne has just shared with you as well. 
So in piloting our toolkit, um, oh, thanks, Suzanne. In piloting our toolkit, really what we wanted to do was get a sense of um, what exactly works for them. We wanted to actually try and get into a conversation with meaningful engagement with our colleagues. And what we discovered was that UDL was broadly understood by our participants. They definitely aligned the three principles of UDL to look like good teaching, good learning and fair assessment. So the idea of the toolkit was a nice way to scaffold and to use maybe stepping stones perhaps in applying the principles of UDL in their use of Moodle for teaching, learning and assessment. So in designing the toolkit, I suppose, and some of the um, results of the piloting and, and what we actually discovered in consultation with our, our colleagues was actually that we needed lots of time. Um, and I suppose each of our participants agreed that they wanted plenty of time to be able to practically apply these templates and these resources and any small or significant changes that they were making in their loop pages. The fact that Suzanne and I were present in this F, uh, focus group or this semi-structured support session was also really important to help us design and to explore what was working well for the faculties who were testing this out. I think some of the real benefits of allowing the time and the space for colleagues to be able to sit with us, to be able to take some time out of their day to redesign or to reimagine what their Moodle pages look like, really allowed and opened up a conversation um, for what was important for both the lecturers and their students as well. With regards, I suppose, to um, what, what also, I suppose, ensures that we're always or we're continuing to design approaches that are efficient and are worthwhile for our student experience was really just about asking our colleagues what were maybe the most frequently asked questions or what were maybe some of the difficulties and what they perceived as barriers to learning for their students. And we were really encouraged, I suppose, looking at the, the responses to the pilot group, we were really encouraged to see that um, it provided the use of these kind of templates and these progression uh, checklists provided clarity for the students and um, allowed our colleagues to be able to organise their loop pages in a way that was able to respond effectively to maybe some of the common barriers or some of the common questions for our students as well. And you'll see some of the pilot group responses um, presented on this slide. Um, our, some of our participants responded that they've completely changed all of their loop pages, which was really encouraging. Um, and ultimately that made them maybe much tidier and perhaps more clearer for the students to be able to um, access information and resources. Also setting up things like um, tasks in a, in a considered way and um, allowed for the students to maybe engage a little bit deeper in some of the concepts or some of the ideas that were being shared as well. So all in all, I suppose, um, while we're still, I suppose, uh, want to roll this out into an institution-wide rollout, uh, hopefully in September, we think this is a really good opportunity. And with all of the, the difficulties surrounding the last few months uh, with the shutdown of our institutions, we're really seeing that UDL can be an opportunity for our faculty to be able to engage with these principles of inclusion, to ensure that as they're redesigning and redeveloping their Moodle pages for next semester, that these toolkits and these checklists and these templates can be helpful um, for them redesigning or reimagining what their loop pages look like. I suppose to um, move on to maybe the next steps perhaps, um, what we would like to do is also um, get your feedback essentially and, and trying to get a sense of what exactly is working in your institutions and, and to share what works best. We're going to be further developing the toolkit again, trying to have this kind of breadth across the institutions for all faculties and particularly perhaps for those faculties or those staff who aren't familiar with the UDL um, principles um, and also offer to, to deliver this and develop this with staff in a scaffolded process. That was something that worked really, really well um, with our colleagues. But also we'd like to, to share this toolkit with you as Moodle users as well to see how it can be adapted or how it can be implemented in your institutions. So finally, I think we would just like to thank you for attending um, this presentation. We'd love to welcome your feedback. Um, as Suzanne mentioned earlier, the toolkit's going to be available through Creative Commons in June. Um, and we'd love to open up to any questions that you may have. So. Thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the, for the invitation. I'm Fran McKegney, and Justin is our learning technologist um, at Avernia. 
We're going to change gears actually quite a bit here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and let me just share my screen. And bump up the presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. Yep. So um, I was, I was uh, while Karen and Suzanne were doing the presentation, which was really, which is really impressive. I think, well, we're really going to change gears here. We've had um, both the interesting opportunity, I guess, and the challenge of um, really looking at teaching and learning and the use of digital technologies in teaching and learning from a very fundamental perspective over the past year. Um, and when Rob uh, sort of approached us about would we like to participate in these, uh, in, in these webinars and suggested competence three of the European framework, uh, teaching and learning, we immediately said yes, not just because we couldn't say no to Rob, but also because this is an area that we have been very guided by and really working on for the for the past year. So just to sort of, you know, ground you in the this particular part of the framework, you can see at the bottom I have this competence refers to designing, planning and implementing the use of digital technologies in the different stages of the learning process. And you can see some of the bullets in, in section three, which is in blue, you know, teaching, guidance, collaborative learning, and self-regulated learning. So Rob said, are you okay to do this? And we said, yes, do you need to make any changes? No, we don't. And the reason was because this is an area that we've been really looking at very closely over the past year. So this is going to be a, a, quite a simple presentation, uh, just a, to, to sort of revisit what we've looked at over the past year and how Moodle fits into our plans going forward. I'm going to sort of talk about the overall architecture that we looked at and then I'll hand over to Justin who will talk more specifically about Moodle's, Moodle's piece uh, within that. Just a little bit on Hibernia for those who don't know us. Um, we're obviously a digital college. Blended learning is our model. Um, for From the perspective of this webinar, let's just say it's 50-50. It's not quite, but I, I think it's, it, it's a good way to think about what we do. So 50% uh, is, is uh, online and then 50% is classroom-based or face-to-face -face and so on. Our students are spread out around the country. Uh, we then organize them into regional groups. We have about 23 different regional groups. Um, and the regional groups are overseen by a college tutor and members of the, uh, of the adjunct faculty. The face-to-face -face elements, so the classrooms and so on, school placements, happen, are regionally based as well. Um, and uh, obviously, in, since uh, COVID-19, we've had to move all of those elements online. So being 100% online at, 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 you know, at, at the moment. Um, in addition to that, we obviously have, uh, because of our teacher training, we obviously have all of the sort of school placements and so on. And so our architecture has to support this very distributed model. And we have to support, um, you know, at least 50%, uh, at least 50% online. Now our model up to now, our VLE is known as my hands. It's Moodle based. It's like a big brain and everybody comes into it from their laptops. And you know, as Rob has said, we have used it very extensively in the last six, seven years and pushed everything through it. What we wanted to do was to step back and revisit uh, our assumptions about, uh, about our digital architecture and to sort of have a broader conversation about what we might need going forward over the next five to 10 years. So we looked at two fundamental questions and we involved everybody from the executive management team down in the discussion about what this might look like. Two big questions were, what will teaching and learning look like in the next five to 10 years? We really took a decade view. We separated out conversations that were next week or next month or next six months uh, in terms of immediate needs and said, what's gonna happen? What do we think is gonna happen? What do we want our teaching and learning to look like over the next five to 10 years? And then what digital architecture will we need to put into place to support this? And does Moodle have a role? Uh, does Moodle have a role in our in, in our future? So very fundamental, uh, very fundamental conversation. What we did was, excuse me, uh, what we did was initially we created six workshops. Um, uh, we chose different themes for the workshops. We gave short presentations, and then opened it up to a broader discussion. We also used Microsoft Teams to create a series of channels around each of the workshops so that we could continue the conversations between the workshops. So on six consecutive Monday afternoons, we ran a series of workshops. We had 
40 to 50 people at each at each session and they included everybody from the executive team to uh, department heads to you know functional uh, leaders in their areas on the subject of what what do we do you know what where do we do what do we do going forward so you can see some of the themes here the role of mobile technologies in Hibernia's future student identity and the student journey using digital technology to strengthen community and learning in the regional groups given our regional structure collaborative learning and research the whole notion of collaboration was key uh, to to our to our work over the past year the future of the VLE future of student support and use of video and teaching and learning uh, and so on we then issued a report you can see the cover of it there on screen and we then got into a series of more detailed workshops for example we spent half a day looking at collaborative structures to support uh, learning and, and, and research. What would, that, what would that look like? We moved away from email and, 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 and so on. How would we make it? How would we make it more collaborative and so on? And in parallel with this, we were looking at technologies in the marketplace, including Moodle competitors to see what would be the best fit based on what came out of these, uh, what came out of these workshops. So a simple functional representation of how we envisage ourselves going forward. Um, instead of Moodle playing this hugely enormous central role that it does at the moment, it would be more a component in a more distributed system um, and, uh, and would interact with those, be seamlessly integrated and interact with those components. So for example, in, in terms of video, um, we fortunately made the decision that uh, there would be a lot more use of video in education over the next decade. We talked about a, a virtual video network. Uh, we got talking to Zoom about a year ago. We did a series of pilots. We deployed before the end of the year. We trained up our staff at the beginning of this year so that when the coronavirus hit us in March, we were actually quite well geared to, to, to deal with the sort of educational implications of what was of what was going on there. We also want to encourage much greater use of mobile technologies in the future, phones, iPads, and, and so on. And we're currently building uh, student and staff mobile apps, which are Hibernia College apps, which will have quite powerful capability, particularly in the area of, particularly in the area of collaboration. Um, when we deployed Zoom, we also deployed Zoom in uh, every member of staff, every student got a full professional license, again, to encourage not just student-student communication, but student-student communication, collaborative research. Our students are postgraduates, um, and so to really put more capability into the hands of both staff and, uh, and students uh, going forward. Other elements, you can see every student has access to Office 365 account, and also kind of focusing on student dashboard initially, but then moving to, to, to dashboards uh, more in general. So in this it, sort of in this kind of functional architecture, then we looked at Moodle and had to make some decisions about how we would move forward with it. And I'm going to hand you over to Justin, who will kind of take the story from here. Brilliant. You can leave it on that slide for a minute, Fran. Um, sure. Thanks, everyone, for... Uh, um, being here, this is fantastic for me. Um, I'm really um, enjoying the session. So thanks to Rob and just to comment and Rob, no, uh, we didn't know it was coming and we didn't buy shares in Zoom. So <laughs> we missed that boat. So I've been pretty much working in building uh, Moodle, um, Tatara and many other VLEs for the past 10 years. And through all that time, we still haven't managed on in with Hibernia now to actually build or turn Moodle into the digital learning unicorn that everyone seems to want. Okay, it's just unattainable. We can't do it. Might be 10 years time, but at the moment, definitely not. And um, so, as I said, we looked at so many other platforms myself. I must have went through about 20, 25, 30 of them, weighed them all up. And the one platform that kept rising to the top was Moodle. Um, just from every point, from ease of use, a lot of the times it's simplicity. So if you just go on to the next slide there, Fran. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Justin. Fran. Is that back on screen for you? 
She's stuck on that one. Sorry. <clears throat> Will I stop sharing and reshare? Yeah, please. So at the workshop, I brought up this slide um, to show staff um, Moodle isn't just a name. There's a reason um, behind the letters, as you see. And most of the time, as I've been working in Moodle and working with it, um, one of the things I've sort of neglected was the first letter there, M, for modular. Okay. We've slowly been packing Moodle with every type of plugin and every type of integration. <clears throat> but realistically, Moodle is fantastic at delivering learning. It's fantastic at enabling um, students to upload assessments, and it's really good at displaying grades. Um, but we, we've consistently tried to pack it with everything else. So we sort of took a step back and say, <clears throat> how can we make this a little bit easier for the students to use, uh, faculty and staff? And we sort of focus in on the modular look and aspect of it. So we just want to move to the next slide there, Grant. So we wanted to create, in Hibernia at the moment, um, we have a module. And inside that module, we'd have subjects. We can have up to four subjects, five subjects. So you'd have one um, module would have English, math, science, and history. And the problem we were having was that all assessments were pushed into one particular module for the whole program. So we decided to create a module hub based around these subjects where um, the assessments were universal between all the subjects, um, the briefs, and it would house a lot of universal documentation that would relate to each one of the subjects. So this would make it easier for students to navigate to their assessments, uh, faculty um, to navigate around the actual subjects themselves, and then staff to um, pull reports and uh, requests from it. So we've put an awful lot of sort of time and effort into pairing back everything we've put into Moodle and um, taking it way back to the basics. Um, as you can see, we're leveraging Moodle's underlying architecture. It's quite simple, um, but it's very powerful. So we're, we're sort of trying to clean house. So in order to do this, we're after um, pushing a new theme and a new instance of Moodle. And we're moving to version 3.9 in September, isn't it, Fran? In September, yeah. In September. And we're using the Azure platform as the portal. So anything regarding um, sort of reports and all will be housed in the portal. Um, so a lot of the staff will not have to actually go into Moodle to pull reports. They can actually do it through the portal. The dashboard for students will be there. So it's a bit, we're actually taking back control of uh, Moodle, of the VLE. So we're taking all um, external items that we would have tried to push into Moodle, we've put them into the portal, and it's just freeing Moodle up to be a learning environment, um, and that's what it's designed to do. So um, this is the last slide here, and as you can see, um, as Fran detailed, all of our external so the sources and functions will be held in the portal and Moodle will be just left as a learning um, platform. So, so uh, one, of the, one of the interesting uh, sort of integrations that we are, are faced with say is the integration of Moodle with a larger number of components um, in, in our architecture. So for example, the student and staff mobile apps will play a very central role in the life of, in, in the, life of the students at launch in September. I'm going to say we have a one-way link between, but it's really one and a half way uh, links, which is largely from Moodle to, to the students, to the students app, notifying them of, you know, college notices, events, webinars, school placement information, and, and so on. There is a return path. It's a little awkward at the beginning. Um, uh, in phase two, then that will become a two, a, a completely two way flow between our own apps and our own collaborative workspaces and Moodle. And that was leading, leads us to some interesting issues like the integration of 
our mobile capabilities with say our discussion forums uh, with, with discussion forums on, on, on Moodle and, and, and so on. So um, what's been interesting to us is when we looked at competitors out in the marketplace, Moodle, as Justin said, clearly rose to the top in terms of scalability, functionality, uh, stability, and so on. But instead of being encompassing our whole world, it has moved back to a more component of our overall architecture focused on a number of key things, the calendar, assessments, delivering the, the, the learning, progress information, and so on that, that, that Justin has, uh, has outlined. And it will be a, an interesting journey over the next couple of years as we see how it, how it develops from here. So just wanted to share, uh, share this with you, and uh, I'll hand back to Rob and any questions that people might have.